my dear friend Sam Hall, I pray you be quickly healed. Saints, draw your swords. I want to see that you are armed and dangerous against the works of darkness. Amen. And turn with me, and you have it there in your bulletin, to Ephesians chapter 6, reading verses 10 through 20. And we're going to focus on the facts. Think about that while we're reading these scriptures. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And as for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Is it a surprise to you that we are war right now, for sure? It's not yet a military or a civil war. In fact, it's a very uncivil war. It's a war between good and evil, right versus wrong. Those of us who are on the right and are fighting for faith, family, freedom, hope, and opportunity. Well, my name is Garrett Deer, and I have approved this message. <laughs> <laughs> Undue burdens, standards must go. Do you want a culture of life or a culture of death? We as Christians, must confront the wrong before it squashes us in our future. And I'm going to say that again, before it squashes us in our future. And don't think for one minute that that's not what's happening. Who would have ever believed in our beloved country that Christians would be persecuted? Now, we're not being persecuted quite to death. But we are definitely at a place of persecution. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, at verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life, that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life and the length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to bring biblical principles of governance to government leaders. 
And I can tell you that for many years, I stood at the Capitol steps in Concord on the opening of the legislature, and I basically brought them what would be called an election day sermon. And one of those election day sermons was done by John Langston from the Baptist Church in Hampton Falls. And by the way, that election day sermon in those days would go two hours before the legislature. Two hours. One of my favorite election day sermons was by Charles Chauncey in 1747. He was the pastor of the first Christian church in Boston for 67 years. Now, if you know about pastoring, not many pastors last 67 years in the same church. It doesn't usually happen that way. And he preached an election day sermon in front of the Royal Governor Shirley, the legislature, and the executive council, and he preached it from 2 Samuel 23.3, and he said, Civil magistrates, and yes, our elected officials are not our rulers. They are our elected officials. They're civil magistrates. I saw the country was wrong. He said in front of these powerful people, and the royal governor in those days was really powerful. If you've ever been to Shirley, Massachusetts, it was named after that royal governor. He said to them, civil magistrates must rule the fear of God or they will be judged. Do you have the courage? Do I have the courage to say that to our elected officials today? Well, we should. Because we want to bring biblical principles of government to government leaders and to the people who elect them. Now, we're focusing on the facts. I believe the Lord that laid that theme, if you will, on my heart because many people are focusing on the fears. Fear has become, we talk about a pandemic or an endemic. That's what's happening in our country right now the pandemic of fear instead of focusing on the facts. Well, here's just a few facts that we need to be focusing on. And most assuredly, by focusing on these facts, it will dispel the fear that most people are living with. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the great physician. Jesus is the supreme judge. And by the way, Ruth Bader Ginsburg who spent many years on the Supreme Court, she's standing before the Supreme Judge of the world, of the universe, right now. And I don't know how well she's doing. I don't think very well, personally, according to her life. And part of the reason I say that, folks, is because she contributed to the death of some 64 million of these little babies. No trial, no rights, just extermination. And needless to say, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm totally pro-life. Yeah. And I'm proud of it, even though I've been threatened with death because of it. There's a few other facts to focus on. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, which you know in the Greek alphabet is the beginning and the end. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He will return very soon. Government cannot save us. What? People in government are telling us all the time how they can save us. Government cannot save us, folks. 
Only Jesus can and will if we let him. And we must turn towards him. Now my commission, I'm not talking about when I was in the army, my commission in the Lord's army is to warn the nations of the second coming of Jesus Christ when his feet will touch down on the Mount of Olives, that's in Zechariah 14, verses 1 through 4. And the consequences of rejecting him, people of God, we must continue to stand in the gap and pray and fast and warn and call people to repent. If they ignore us, judgment will fall. But God will spare, save, and honor righteous believers in Christ. We're in a spiritual or cultural battle. Jesus Christ versus the Antichrist. Heaven versus hell. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And you must be one too. I can say we are at a crossroads from which, if we turn wrongly, our country will not return. As President Reagan said, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this and the last best hope of man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. America has taken more than her first step toward darkness. We've been walking and now seemingly running toward the darkness of communism for many years. And like a cockroach that scurries from the light, there are those who have run from the light of biblical truth, deceiving themselves and others that darkness offers freedom rather than death. I can't help sometimes when people are critical of Christians and critical of the church. And needless to say, as a Christian and one who loves the church, the ecclesia, God's body, the church, I don't like to hear the criticisms, but I listen, and sometimes there's some measure of truth to that. Asking the question, how in a country with so many Christians could some of these things happen? And I think, and having been trained in military science as an army officer, I took many years, I took four years of military science. And I've studied every kind of military leader, actually from my boyhood days, it was a favorite subject to me, more than studying romance and so forth and so on, as some people would do, I like studying war. And so I read about all the great warriors, whether they were Greek, whether they were Roman, whether they were Persian, whether they were Chinese, whether they were Japanese, or whoever they were, and what techniques they used, and so forth and so on. And it came to me one day, many years later, that we have a mighty army of Christians in this country. And with the numbers that we're told that are, we have in this country, how is it possible that we have been defeated in so many different things, whether it be homosexual marriage, or let me back up, whether it be abortion, same-sex marriage, whether it be pornography, which runs rampant, or stealing. And when I talk about stealing, I'm not just talking about a guy with a gun and a mask robbing a local bank. I'm talking about the stealing that's being done about our virtue in this country and young people and things that are being done to young people and what's being taught to young people. You know, years ago, 
Richard Zebulon Foster wrote a book, None Dare Call It Communism, in 1934. And of course, he said, We cannot call it communism, Americans will never go for it. We can't call it socialism, they won't go for it. And the reason they won't go for it, you saw the bag it was carrying. I'm a G14. I'm a 14th generation from the Mayflower. Because in this country, this country was started by the Mayflower Compact in the Plymouth Colony. They wouldn't go for it. But what Americans have gone for is liberalism and progressivism. And it's just been a cloak for the lie that's communism. So we have to focus on the facts. Joseph's story, we're talking about Supreme Court justices these days, in 1833, he was a Supreme Court Justice. Republics are created by the virtue, public spirit, and intelligence of the citizen. They fall when the wise are, if by the liberty of the press, or understood merely the liberty of discussing the propriety of public measures and political banished from the public councils because they dare to be honest and the profligate are rewarded because they flatter the people in order to betray them. Many times when I read these statements by these, what we'll call them founding fathers or founders, and by the way, there are lots of founding mothers as well as founding fathers. They were prophetic. They were prophetic. They were prophesying. And being a son of the American Revolution as I am, and that's an organization, and I'm an officer of that organization, I had on the Battle of Lexington the day about 20 ancestors fighting. What were they fighting for? And don't think they were fighting only for themselves. <coughs> and I see today with us, young people and children, it was so exciting to see a baby come in. What I'm fighting for at 73 years of age is not for myself anymore. I'm fighting for them. Because they're our posterity. And that's what our founding fathers said. We're not just fighting for ourselves. They actually literally said we are fighting for our posterity. And one of the things that has changed my life, I've had several epiphanies, if you will, in my life. Standing in Fennel Hall in Boston, speaking there many times for the Boston Tea Party event, I was standing at the pulpit there, and I just was directed of the Lord to look down. I looked down on my feet, and I moved my feet, and I was standing in footprints, because that staging was all wood. And the footprints that were worn into the, worn into the wood, and it dawned on me, whose footprints are these now? I wear a size 14 shoe, they were a lot smaller than that. <laughs> Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Josiah Quincy, Joseph Warren, people like that. Those were their footprints, and I was standing in them, and this is what I heard. They were my servants, but they're not here anymore. You are, and I'm looking at you. I was standing in front of the Lexington Minuteman. And by the way, on your bulletin, you've got the Concord Minuteman. That's not the Lexington, and that's the Concord. 
the front of your bullet. If you go to Concord Bridge, you'll see that many men. He's a good one too. Mm -hmm. but standing in front of the Lexington Minutemen, I had the same epiphany. You notice I'm using the word that we use basically religiously as Christians and epiphany. I'm saying the Lord spoke to us and don't be so freaked out about the Lord speaking to you because honestly the Lord says my sheep shall know the sound of my voice. Amen. 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 Be surprised if he doesn't speak to you. And to your dialing a little better so he can and he will. So standing there, I had the same epiphany. I was looking at the minute man and thought, what a fine figure of a man. And I thought, I'd like to be a fine figure of a man like him. And the Lord said to me, yes, a fine figure of a man. And it's actually a statue representing John Parker, the captain, that led the minute man there in Lexington on the day. And once again, I heard from the Lord, he was my servant, and so were they. And Jonas Clark, the pastor, but they're not here anymore. You are. Now I'm looking at you. Well, I've never been one throughout my whole life, really, to shirk my responsibilities. Some people say I take too many responsibilities. I guess I sometimes say, well, I do take too many because most people take too little. When you focus on the facts, you're not going to get those from TV, radio, newspapers, gossip, or your neighbor, or sorry to say, from our government. Only by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. When Brother Taylor said how he appreciated teaching the Bible study and, and and missed it when he wasn't able to continue that here at that time. All of us should be continuing that Bible study at home every day. Most people are so proficient in television. They can tell you what NBC, ABC, CBC, whatever, Not many people can tell you what the Bible says about anything. Christians should know their Bible, be able to quote it, and if you can't quote it, at least carry it around with you and be able to open it and read certain passages to people and say, this is what the Bible says. Now, don't be surprised if you say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the Bible. Okay, well, the Bible believes in you even if you don't believe in the Bible. God believes in you even if you don't believe in him. You never know when you're going to get a breakthrough. So doing what is right keeps us walking in the light. And in the Lord's might, you look at Proverbs 21, 22, I like to say might makes right. No, right makes might. In the way of the world, might makes right. In the way of the Lord, right makes might. We're mighty when we're right. The Proverbs 16, 7. When a, way, a man's ways please the Lord, he can make even his enemies be at peace with him. I trust the Lord to perform according to his word. <coughs> Especially as he expects me to live my life according to his word. If you don't make yourself and your cause, which should be the cause of Christ, heard, then you're what's for dinner. And there's plenty of wolves out there looking to eat sheep. And I always tell people Jesus is the Lamb of God. But what else is Jesus? He's the Lion of Judah. 
So sometimes we need to be more of a lion and less of a lamb. And don't fear being canceled by the culture. There was a time when it bothered me. It was kind of funny, years ago, I was scheduled by the Mayflower Society in Wisconsin, which is a very big branch of the Mayflower Society, to come and speak out there. And I was excited about it. In those days, I was traveling all over the country, all 50 states, and <laughs> Eastern Europe, and so forth. I was excited about it, and then I got a call canceling me. I said, why? <laughs> And the person who was calling and canceling me said, because you're too religious and you're too political. Can you imagine that? The Mayflower Society? Too religious and too political? What do you think the Mayflower was all about? <laughs> That's how things have changed. So don't worry about being canceled by the culture. If you're faithful, it will likely happen, and you should expect it to. Besides, the cancel culture that we are facing today is quite watered down compared to what other Christians have faced and are facing in different places of the world. And by the way, Christians are being murdered in India right now. Right now, with Modi, the new prime minister, Christians in India are being murdered, and the government is doing nothing about it. And in Nigeria and other places like that. Here's what cancel culture looked like in Paul's day, the Apostle Paul. So he, Paul, went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. And they, the Hellenists, were seeking to kill him. Acts chapter 9, verses 28 through 29 records that for us. Did the Apostle Paul stop preaching because they were trying to kill him? No. If you live for an audience of one, in other words, yourself, you'll suffer these problems. <coughs> But we are told to live for an audience of one, meaning God, and love your enemies. Trust your God to be your shield, to care for you, to cover you with his love, just as he said he would, true to his word. And of course, let me back up with us to the initial passage that I read, which is true spiritual warfare and putting on the full armor of God every day. <clears throat> now, if you've ever played sports or being in the military, every day that you're involved, you have to put on the uniform. You can't just show up wearing whatever you want. You've got to put on the uniform. I graduated from military academy, and every day they announced over the loud speaker, they went through all the barracks, what we would be wearing for the day. It wasn't like, oh, let's see, should I wear blue, should I wear black, should I wear green, should I wear this or that? No, you didn't get a choice. You were told, wear this. And if you showed up and you weren't wearing that, you'd be marching punishment to us for being a rebel. So when the Lord tells us, this is not a suggestion, basically a type of command. This is what I want you to wear every day. Put on the full armor of God because that's the only way you're going to be able to withstand what you're going to face. And sometimes I like to think of it like the armor that was put on for uh, knights of the round table kind of. They put that armor on to go into battle. If they didn't put the right armor on, they were going to get hurt. So we trust our God to be our shield, to 
care for us, to cover us with his love, just as he said he would through his word. And of course, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Say that with me. Power, love, and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.6. And then, of course, I find myself at this time where people are so afraid of the pandemic of fear, saying, you're going to have to spend a lot of time reading the 91st chapter of the book of Psalms. Because that's the antidote. That's the description. So we want to wake up. And by the way, the word that goes around these days is woke. Hey, are you woke? No, I'm not woke. I might be broke, but I'm not woke. <laughs> but I am awake. Wake up. God is sovereign. Reverse the curse. How can we reverse the curse on our society? Remember that love is not just a noun. It's an action verb. You know, like John 3.16, for God so loved the world. That's an action verb. Not just a noun. And that's the type of love we must have. First and foremost, that we love Christ with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And because we do that, then we can love our neighbor as ourself. And love them the way Christ wants us to love them. And honestly, sometimes loving them is telling them the truth. A neighbor next door to us, I've been neighbors with them for 16 years. She was on my front step one day, and I had to tell her the truth. I mean, she's into all, all kind of things, whether it's Black Lives Matter, but she doesn't have a problem with abortion, and, you know, same-sex marriage, or any other stuff. Right there on my doorstep, I had to tell her, you're wrong about these things. No, I'm not. Yes, you are wrong about them. How do you know I'm wrong about it? Because it's against God's Word. I was surprised you would talk to me again, but <laughs> you sort of have to be them there. I would hope that what I've shared with you this morning here would make you uncomfortable. <laughs> Do you believe that? Forgive me, Pastor Sam. I want to make your people feel uncomfortable. By telling you these things. Why? Because, because I love you. I know your pastor loves you. And I hope that what I've shared here would make you uncomfortable, so uncomfortable that you will take action to stand greater, stronger, better, and more efficiently for biblical truth. This is right versus wrong. This is evil versus good. I know that sounds very simplistic, but that's what it is. So we're focusing on the facts, not focusing on the fears, focusing on the facts. And here's an interesting one. And I take this as a challenge to me as well. The world has yet to see what God will do with people who fully consecrated to I don't want to see that in my own life. And I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his Spirit. Think about that. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. 
every time, every day that I open the Bible. I ask the Holy Spirit to be my teacher. I've had the good opportunity throughout my many years of being a Christian and serving Him to have many good mentors and friends who were pastors and teachers and so forth. But my number one teacher has been the Holy Spirit. He's never failed me. The other night, as I do frequently, and I do have my fears, I do have my doubts, like anyone else. I put my pants on one leg at a time, too. Those of you who wear pants. <laughs> I'll tell you what I do about that. I certainly pray. But I usually put on some praise music. I really appreciate it today in our worship here. It was good. It was wonderful. It was great hearing that shofar. Let me tell you, I blew on the shofar corner to corner of the state. Mine's only a double twist. People that gave it to me when they got it came right from Israel and they called it the stink horn. It smelled so bad when it smelled coming out of it. It's not easy to blow that, so you did a great job. I mean, that's, that's as good as I've ever heard, really. You should have been watching it last week with all the Messianic Jews. That would have been tremendous. Because I don't think any of them blew it any better than you did that, honestly. And I know that that's the trump of God. I think that's the trump we're going to hear when we hear the trump of God. We'll hear that. Probably going to be a show far. And so, when I start to feel doubtful or whatever, I start to praise Him. I take Him in His word as God inhabits the praise of His people. So think about that at home. You know how beautiful it is when you get together and have collective worship. But think about that at home. Are you worshiping him at home? Are you putting the music on? Okay. You don't have to have music to sing. Sing a cabobo. You know, it's not an accompaniment. <laughs> or a cappella. Just sing. And you'd be surprised how your spirit will lift. And the Lord will be present with you in a special measure. Because he inhabits the praise of his people. I love to do praise externally outside in the church building. I like people driving by. I, I, I do quite a few of those throughout the year in different places. Where people are driving by and we're out there praising the Lord and raising our voices and singing. And I'm thinking, okay. They go by and think, what's wrong with those people? If we were playing football or we were at a sporting event, they wouldn't think what's wrong with those people. And you won't be surprised, and I'm bringing this to a close, when I say this. Sabotage the enemy by never letting the lies go unanswered. Be bold for the truth and rescue those being led into false perspectives by deceivers. And of course, sometimes I open or sometimes I close with this. There is no other king but King Jesus. Amen.